Hi, this is Lex, and welcome to the Fintech Blueprint. It's your podcast about fintech, decentralized finance, digital banking, investing, robo-advice, artificial intelligence, and all the other frontier technology that is transforming financial services. To get more content, like an illustrated transcript of this conversation in your inbox, subscribe at fintechblueprint.com. So without further delay, let's jump into today's episode. Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's podcast conversation. I'm really excited to have with us today Prashant, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Fundbox and has been in technology and entrepreneurship with some really fantastic experiences. We are going to learn about digital lending as well as artificial intelligence and big tech and all sorts of really interesting stuff. Prashant, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Alex. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I am very excited for this conversation because I think you bring a very unique experience to the fintech sector. So maybe we start with that foundational kind of career experience that you've had. What are some of the most important things in your mind that have come together to form your career? So Lex, I am the CEO of a company today, which I guess makes me a tech executive. And I've been one for some time, but at heart, I'm really a product manager. And what really excites me is using technology to build products that, that have, have an impact. And I've been fortunate, as, as you mentioned, to have been able to work at a number of very interesting and diverse companies over the last two decades in Silicon Valley, across the consumer internet and, and advertising and monetization and payments. And for the last six years here at Fundbox, which is really fintech for, for small businesses. In terms of some of the things that have really helped me, I'll just throw out a few. Having worked across startups and large companies has been really helpful for me. I can claim to have worked at every size of company from five people all the way to 35,000. So there's no size of company between five and 35,000 people that I haven't been part of. And that's helpful because as I work with Fundbox and scale the company, I've got a little bit of perspective, you know, some battle scars, if you will, that I can leverage to, to understand what's the right formula or the right gear for the right scale of a company. So that, that's been helpful. I think another thing that's been been relevant is just the, my grounding in consumer internet. So having worked at Yahoo, Google, and Facebook, so all companies that have you know, focused on the consumer internet has, has taught me a lot about consumers and users and the importance of building products that are simple and delightful and not only for communication and media and entertainment, but also for things like financial services. I've also been really privileged to have observed a lot of very successful business and technology leaders from up close and have learned a lot of lessons from, you know, by just observing their styles and, and their actions. So just a lot of learning. And I'll say that I consider myself a perpetual student. And so even though I'm getting on in years, I, I, I never want to stop learning because that's exciting and fun and, and keeps things fresh. Absolutely. And I think you're underplaying it a little bit. And I want to double click on your experiences at companies like Google and Facebook. And you know, one of the things that has been in the common fintech imagination for a while now, and as we are moving closer to a vision of you know Web3 and the metaverse, it's coming back, these questions. But there's a core question I think lots of people have about how the consumer internet companies or you know the big technology companies, how do they relate to finance? What is the motion by which they engage with financial services, whether that's payments or, you know, or lending or otherwise? Can you share some things out of your experience that plug into that question? I think that all of the consumer internet giants are in many ways well positioned to play bigger roles in the broader world of financial services, whether it's payments or, or credit or insurance or investment and so on. 
The reasons are obvious. Access to a large number of users, access to a lot of data, talent around building technology and products. There's a lot of good reasons for these folks to be playing a larger role in financial services. Yet at the same time, there are also some challenges. Challenges like focus. Financial products are different in many ways. We can talk about that and and require dedicated attention and focus. A question of culture and style. It's very different to build a video sharing app and the level of almost like responsibility is a little bit different when you're building a video sharing app versus building a product that moves money around or deals with people's savings. And then it's also the question of regulation and regulatory scrutiny, which I think these large companies are increasingly coming under and has them be a little bit more defensive when it comes to financial services, which is obviously a heavily regulated industry. So there's both a lot of reasons why these companies could be playing a larger role, but then also a good set of reasons why they're playing more on the periphery of financial services today. So for example, generating money from financial services companies through advertising, for example, or partnerships where they're introducing financial services to their customers, but not necessar- not always participating in the transactions directly. Yeah, absolutely. And what's mixed together is the desire to give access to some particular financial product or you know, financial feature as integrated into the payment experience or the checkout experience versus actually underwriting or making the financial product. Those are two very different roles. Is that an accurate kind of painting of how a large technology firm would think about intermediating finance? That is one very important distinction. Giving your customers or your consumer customers in this case access to a financial service doesn't necessarily mean that you have to run the service all by yourself. I think Amazon is an interesting example of that. When it comes to financial services for sellers on the Amazon platform, so sell, folks selling in the Amazon marketplace, kind of as, as you well know, they've partnered with someone like Goldman Sachs to provide some capital services. But in addition to that, so that itself is a partnership. And in, in addition, they also have a, a marketplace where they have a number of other players providing capital to Amazon merchants. This, by the way, isn't a very big part of our business, but we also do serve folks that have P2C businesses on Amazon. But frankly, that that it isn't just limited to some of these large consumer internet players. Even players like Stripe, for example, which is itself a financial services company, has launched the Stripe app marketplace and Funbox is a launch partner of the Stripe app marketplace where we're providing capital to Stripe merchants. So this idea that you can create more value in your ecosystem by leveraging other services is a strong one. And it isn't just restricted to consumer internet players, even fintech players themselves might partner with other fintechs to provide services that they deem are not very core or are adjacent to what they want to focus on. And I want to get into Funbox in a moment, but one of the ways I want to get there actually is to think about what you've said in terms of scale and in terms of you know business building and the experience of being entrepreneurial you know within a larger platform versus the experience of being entrepreneurial sort of without any support or any backing, just staring into you know the wilderness and going out and fighting and hunting and building your own company from scratch. Can you talk a little bit about the skill sets and kind of the experiences of those two different approaches? I think when you're building a business, you're always trying to figure out what building blocks already exist that you can use. And in some ways, that's literally the definition of the word platform. Now, I realize that the word platform is used by different people to mean different things. But one definition of the word platform is a building block, something that you can take 
and build your own products and services on. So, of course, in today's world, you know, you use the word fighting by yourself in the wilderness, but almost anybody who's starting a technology company is already using building blocks like Amazon Web Services, for example, for storage and commute and so on. So I think is it really a question of whether you are using building blocks or not? I think it's a question of how much of what you're doing is using existing building blocks and where do you build your own proprietary technology or products and deliver the, the ultimate service to your, your customers? I think that at Funbox, of course, when it comes to technology, we, we use platforms that are out there. For example, we run on AWS. There are many things in our technology stack where we made the decision to not reinvent the wheel, but use best-in-class building blocks that are out there. But then there are, of course, certain areas where we do build our own tech. So, for example, when it comes to our machine learning models and our AI, where we use certain building blocks for things like monitoring and maintaining our models. But of course, our models are developed in-house by our own teams. And there's a fair amount of IP that goes into our data sources, our, our data assets, and our, and our machine learning models, and the software that converts those predictions into actions. So that's sort of one part. It's more around building the product itself. But when it comes to distribution, one decision we made at Fundbox was to do a little bit of both. In other words, roughly half our business is direct to the customer, where customers are coming to our mobile app or our website to use Funbox, call it natively. And then the other half of our business is us embedding ourselves into other ecosystems like Stripe, like QuickBooks, like FreshBooks, like other invoicing accounting platforms or e-commerce platforms. So, so we, we're, we're doing this sort of both ways because these are both very viable and attractive models for us. The conversation has turned towards Funbox, so let's open up what Funbox is. You know, and you recently, I think, closed a hundred million dollar Series D round, and both fantastic timing and well deserved. I think a Funbox is one of the stronger companies to be in the market right now in the current environment, and you know, continuing to grow. I think a lot of other unicorns have struggled this year. And all the news and progress of your company seems to be doing fantastic. And so let's frame a little bit for our audience what the company does and maybe if you can share some high-level stats on its size and you know, its activities, that would be great. Sure. So Funbox is an embedded working capital platform for small businesses. So what that means is that we use technology to help small business owners optimize their cash flow cycles. Our solutions are embedded within the business systems that our customers tend to use, like Intuit QuickBooks or FreshBooks or or Stripe, as well as a bunch of other partners. Funbox focuses on working capital because small businesses need working capital to survive and thrive. It's like oxygen. For them, and like oxygen, you just don't need it some of the time, you need it all the time. The motivation behind Funbox and our focus on helping small business owners with their inbound and outbound cash flows and managing the timing and managing that working capital is because more than 80% of small businesses that fail don't fail because they don't have a good product or they don't have any customers. They fail because they're not able to manage the timing of the inflows and outflows of cash. It's as simple as that. So it's a huge problem. And at the same time, there is a trillion dollars, over a trillion dollars of unpaid receivables that are owed to small businesses in the US alone at any time. So the irony is that you've got small businesses and there are over 30 million of them in the US that one, often fail because of cash flow challenges but at the same time, are often owed large amounts of money by their customers. So that's really the origin and uh, the mission of Fundbox, which is really helping to power the small business economy 
by using technology to help with working capital. In terms of stats, when we've shared this, this information kind of publicly, I think when we raised our Series D back in October, we talked about having crossed $100 million in revenue run rate. Earlier this year, I think it was in May, we, we shared that we had crossed $160 million in annual revenue run rate. So we're, we're growing and, I, and we've reached some scale in terms of revenue, obviously a long, long way to go. We're getting larger. We served over 100,000 small business customers and, and growing rapidly. We are about 350 people across the US and Israel. We've transacted over $3 billion since the company was, was founded, and we think we will, we will transact over a billion dollars in originations this year. That's amazing, especially to experience that kind of growth in this kind of year must be super exciting. The small business market and the problem that you're aimed at is so profound and foundational to just the economy being the economy that there's probably endless fuel for that fire. A question for you on the earlier thing you said about embedding this product. What does it practically mean that you know the lending product is embedded? Where is it embedded? How does that work? Embedding is not binary. It's a spectrum. And when I think about the word embedding in the way it's used today, I think it's used to describe, broadly describe like a, a bunch of things. And I'll highlight three of them. One is this distribution, which is how do you just put your button or your banner or whatever it is such that you're, you appear in front of as many customers as possible or as many relevant customers as possible. That's a very light sort of embedding in the sense that a partner could send and could blast an email campaign with your name or your link on it. Is it embedding? Not really, but do people use that term in that context? Sometimes they do. I think a slightly deeper sense of embedding is really when it comes to data. So using data that's native to the, the platform or the system that you're in to be able to kind of provide a better service. And tied to that, which I think is a third thing, is the experience. So is the product itself tailored to match the ecosystem that you're in? To, to provide the most value for the customers. So a good example, in my humble opinion of embedding is our relationship with, with QuickBooks. So we've been working with QuickBooks for over six years now. We are the only working capital provider to be natively embedded inside of QuickBooks Online. So, uh, and QuickBooks Desktop as well. So what does that mean? It means that if you're a small business owner, who is using QuickBooks and you are in your accounts receivable module. So you're looking at the invoices that you have issued to your customers and you're thinking about, about your, your cash situation. There's a call to action inside the AR module that lets you essentially advance capital against an invoice. Now, that experience is fairly deep embedding because of a few reasons. One, we're presented inside of the QuickBooks AR module. Two, when you engage with us, the experience is kind to have the look and feel of QuickBooks. In fact, it's been designed in collaboration with the QuickBooks product team. It is still hosted by Funbox, so there's a powered by Funbox sort of thing there, but it, you're never leaving QuickBooks at all. You don't have to create a new account. It's single sign-on. And in fact, all of our emails and notifications deep link you back into the QuickBooks experience. And because we have like a deep, we have deep data connectivity with QuickBooks, all you have to do is essentially give Funbox access to your QuickBooks data and about 80, 90% of the work is already done. So it's a very slick experience. It literally takes a couple of minutes at the most for a customer to sign up with Funbox. And then, of course, because we are running our machine learning models on the data in real time, it takes a few more seconds to get access to capital. So that's a pretty good experience. And you know, we keep working on, on improving it 
But that to me is a, is a good example of, of an embedded experience. In terms of the shape of the customer, I'm sure that at your scale, you're probably seeing every type of customer, but where was some of the earlier traction for the company? What kind of market segments did you start in and expand out of? We've been careful to focus on a, call it a segment of customers where there is sort of good, I hate to use the word synergy, but synergy between the needs of the customer and our approach to serving them which is really around automation and technology. So we serve the smaller end of small businesses. The word SMB in the US can mean a lot of different things. The Small Business Administration defines an SMB as anyone that has fewer than than 500 employees. By which definition, Funbox itself is an SMB because we have about 350 people. Now, it turns out that most of the SMBs in terms of volume, in terms of number of customers, are the smaller end of SMBs. Think of these as sole proprietors, people with five or 10, maybe a dozen employees, maybe 20 employees, people doing a few tens of thousands of dollars to a few hundreds of thousands of dollars, or maybe a few millions of dollars in annual revenue. That's where we focus because of a few reasons. One, it's a vastly underserved market. I don't know if you know this, but it would, it takes a bank about three to four thousand dollars in human capital to assess the needs of and and viability of a small business because you need an auditor, you need an underwriter to go in and take a look at the books of a business. Now, if the business wants a million dollar loan, it makes sense for the bank to invest that four thousand dollars in that on that customer. But if the business needs a twenty thousand dollar line of credit, it's no longer economically viable for the bank to serve them. So our focus is a lot on using data, business transaction data to make decisions, highly, highly automated. So 99.7% of our decisions are automated. And that lets us actually serve effectively and efficiently the small end of small businesses. So that's been our focus all along. That continues to be our focus as as we go forward. One, because the market is highly underserved, and two, because our focus on technology and automation really helps us serve that market well. And it turns out also that with smaller customers that have smaller dollar needs, we can afford to automate because it turns out that as you automate decision-making, machine learning models can make mistakes. Those mistakes are expensive in the world of credit because if you originate to a customer who doesn't pay you back, you lose your principal. But you can do a lot, you can make a lot more mistakes when and train your models when you're working with smaller dollar amounts, which again sort of works really well for us. Our customers tend to use Funbox not only once, but many times a year. So our median repeat usage is nine times a year. So when a customer gets access to a working capital line of credit with us, they're taking small amounts of of capital in bite-sized chunks based on their needs many, many times a year, which again plays well into our whole, you know, sort of transaction model where we can use that data to underwrite and continue training our, our machine learning models. So what's the difference between machine learning and you know statistical approach to underwriting. Can you talk a little bit more about the meat and potatoes of whether it's deep learning or how does the algorithm work? And then if you have any evidence or any numbers on how it has performed over different cohorts, that would be really interesting. There has been in the past a lot of talk and a lot of hype about, about machine learning. And I think a lot of folks have oversold sort of the black magic aspect of of building statistical models. First of all, statistical models are the cornerstone of machine learning. So for example, if you're predicting the likelihood that a transaction is going to be, say, fraudulent, or that a customer might default on a loan, well, there is some sort of statistical model like a logistic regression model at the heart of that. And that's something that is what we also use at Funbox to to drive predictions. I think the success or failure of data science and a statistical modeling or machine learning approach is really more around how you run a data operation. So what I'm talking about is 
what data do you have access to? How real time and rich is that data? Can you create value by combining different data sets that folks may not have done before? And can you continue to build and train, but then also run and measure machine learning models kind of all the time? And again, automate the decision making based on those models. And I think so for Funbox, some of the elements are every single Funbox customer has given gives Funbox access to at least one transactional business system. It could be their accounting software, it could be their invoicing system, it could be their e-commerce platform, or just their bank account, because some of our customers don't even use any of the others. So we have real-time access to that data that's there. The second is because this data is virtually free for us, we can keep running our models all the time. So we don't have to worry about the costs of running our models because really the, the only costs are the costs of AWS, right? That, that's the, the, the biggest thing. It's just the compute cost. And then because we translate the predictions into decisions through software, those decisions can be done immediately, very efficiently. With, with almost, again, zero marginal costs. And we can keep reassessing customers as their needs change or as their businesses change, which is an important part of our business. If you think about, but all of this is, is great, but at the end of the day, it is important for us to make good predictions and to, to run a business with good margins. And so I think that one good data point came out of the COVID-induced economic shock in March of 2020. So when COVID hit, back in March of 2020, the small business economy was severely impacted. We saw within a few weeks, a 35% drop in invoicing activity for our customers. However, we were able to continue serving our customers through that shock. And we only saw, I would say, a modest increase in delinquencies for the first couple of months after which our delinquencies returned to pre-COVID levels. And they stayed in the single digit percentage range. Whereas for many folks that serve small businesses, those delinquencies grew by a factor of 5X or even 10X, leading to a lot of those, those, those players either temporarily or permanently exiting the market. So COVID was a really strong proof point for us that our machine was able to respond very well to a very sharp, sudden, acute shock and update our assessment of, of, of risk and the actions that we were taking very, very quickly. In terms of the capital that is being lent out to your clients, where does that capital come from? What's your setup? Are you extending your own capital? Or are you working with a partner bank? Are there third parties whose capital you syndicate? How does it work? So today we work with a couple of partners, one a very large asset manager and the other being a large bank. And those partners have set up facilities for us to originate. We're actively involved and, and working on adding more and more sources of funding. We expect to work more directly with banks to have them buy some of our originations. So in a kind of a different model. And I think sometime next year, we'll also securitize some of our originations as well. The one thing that's really different about Fundbox that makes funding a lot easier is that our needs are actually very modest. And that's because we are focused on working capital, which is inherently very short duration. When I mentioned earlier that our customers use us on an average nine times a year, they're taking out typically very short duration draws. Say someone might draw $5,000 for 12 weeks or $20,000 for 24 weeks. Most our, our average duration of a draw is around 18 to 20 weeks. So it's fairly short duration. And because it's fairly short duration, we can serve a large number of customers with a fairly large amount of originations in terms of volume. But because the duration is short, we don't need a whole lot of capital 
at any point in time to manage that. So that actually helps keep our assets fairly light. And we're, we're in the process of just further diversifying our funding sources to keep, to, to stay asset light and, kind of, and nimble in this environment. It's a question that's really quite tricky for digital lenders historically, because you're on the one hand building out the asset side of the platform so that you have enough to lend out. But then on the other hand, you are trying to get exposure to enough risks and risks of the same type and so on. Was that a challenge at all to bootstrap that at the same time? I think there are a few things that that helped. The first, I would say, is that the short duration helped because, again, we're turning over our capital four or five times a year. So what that means is if you were to draw a contrast to, say, like a conventional loan, let's just take, for example, five-year loans. Duration, five years. Our credit duration, one-fifth of a year. So there's a 25x difference. There's a 25x difference in our capital needs versus someone that is that is providing five-year term loans. So that makes sense. So our needs are much smaller. So that is really helpful. That's number one. The second thing that really helped us as we were talking to partners and potential partners about our funding needs was just the fact that the majority of our business is repeat business. So in any quarter, in any year, the vast majority of our originations are coming from customers who've been with us for a while. So just to give you some some metrics, our, our first customer cohorts came in 2014 when we just launched the service. And even today in 2022, so eight years later, we see roughly twice the amount of revenue from 2014 customers as we did in 2014. So if you think about what's happened is over eight years, those customers have actually grown their usage of Fundbox to the point where they are doing more than twice as much volume and revenue with us as they did eight years ago. So this really comforts folks that want to partner with us from a funding standpoint because they see customer cohorts and their track records. So they understand that the risk of our business is very different than if every year or we were essentially acquiring new customers all the time because customers who've been on the platform now for two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight years are customers on, on whom we have a lot of data, a lot of longitudinal data, and, uh, and, you know, and sort of good performance metrics that folks can look at. Does that make sense? So I think for those reasons, and of course, our actual performance in terms of delinquencies and so on, uh, for those reasons, we've been, I think, fairly fortunate to not have to struggle that much with, with access to funding. And so feel that we have a fairly solid foundation and a strong model to grow off. You had mentioned from the customer experience, I'm sure the automation and the speed with which they they get the disbursement is one of the reasons that it's so sticky that they come back because it's probably a lot easier to deal. <laughs> this is a sad state of affairs, but it's a lot easier to deal with an automated machine learning powered vending machine than it is to deal with a traditional bank. Yes, and... I'm going to go with your, with your analogy a little bit. Imagine if you wanted you know, a can of soda, and that's all you wanted at that time, but your vending machine gave you a, a can of soda, but a retailer could only give you a 24-pack that was more expensive, that was perishable, and that you didn't really need, right? Now, maybe that's not the best example because I'm not sure I want to use soda as an example, but I think what we've we've found is that customers want to be able to use bite-sized chunks of capital. And they want to be able to draw what they need and keep it for as long as they want and not have to pay for funds beyond the time that they need it or for more funds than they actually need. So this idea that you have credit on tap, it's available for you, but you only pay when you use it is very, very appealing. And a lot of the customers, about 80%, are B2B in nature, which means that they are serving other businesses and waiting to get paid. So for them to spend, let's just say, I'll make a number up, 50 basis points of their revenue 
to get access to a service that can accelerate the inflow of cash as and when they need it is just good costs of doing business. Oftentimes, these customers aren't using credit cards on the receivable side. So they think about Fundbox and our working capital service as a way to, as sort of a, a service around their revenue that can give them cash when they need it. And, and so because they only use it when they need it, it works out to be fairly efficient from a dollar's perspective. One last question I wanted to ask you about customer acquisition. How do you build a machine that repeatedly grows the company? What are the levers that have been successful for you in this particular space, right? Because it's kind of an intersection of a couple of things. It's an intersection of being within these distribution channels of living inside of software, but it's also kind of a very particular proposition, right, for a business in a very particular part of its life cycle. Can you talk a little bit about in building the company, how did you think about the go-to-market organization? There's one thing I'd like to mention up front, which is that the need for access to working capital is very, very broad. So I don't actually think it's a company at a certain stage in its evolution. I think that every small business needs access to working capital, and that's a perpetual need. Now, if you're a larger SMB, let's suppose you're doing $10 million a year in revenue and you have access and you have a 500 person team or a 200 person team, chances are you have access to and you're better served by a bank. And so your working capital needs could be managed through your team and, and, a, and a traditional financial institution. But for the almost 29 million out of the 30 million SMBs that are less than a million dollars a year in revenue, you don't get that service from a bank because it's expensive for the bank to, to manage this manually or with human capital. So this is a very, very large market. It's just highly underserved. So that's, that's sort of one thing. The, so what helps us in building a business? I'd say, Lex, the first thing is it's a very large market and highly underserved. And so that's, that's helpful. I'd say the other thing that helps us build and continue to go our business, which is maybe not obvious, is one of the best means of customer acquisition is good customer retention. So every year when we're thinking about, let's say, driving a certain amount of revenue, if we know that 70, 75, maybe 80% of our revenue is going to come from existing customers, that's a very different business than having to acquire every new, like every new cus- customer from scratch to drive 100% of your revenue. So again, we're, you know, our model, which is predicated on having customers that come in, like your product, use it over and over again for a long period of time, aligning incentives between the customer success and our success is just really, really powerful. If a customer comes to Fundbox and uses us only once, never comes back, we lose money on them. The bulk of our business and the bulk of our revenue and definitely the bulk of our profits come from customers who've, who've been using us for a long time and who've grown with Fundbox. So that's, that's another thing. And then, of course, there is all the strategies around acquiring distribution partners or partners that you can embed and, again, align incentive with your partners. We have sort of a very, very strong direct acquisition team and platform that uses the same data and the same technology to optimize our marketing spend and, and be very effective in how we acquire customers through direct channels. So there's a lot of goodness in our marketing efforts, our partnership efforts. But I think it starts with these two things. One, a very large TAM, a very large market. And then two, a product that drives retention because that really makes the acquisition easier or conversely, it makes it easier to, to build a business without having to reacquire all your customers every year. That's very insightful. And I think a great point of advice for entrepreneurs it is uh, it's much easier to acquire a customer that you already have than to get a new one. And I think people don't always think about that when they're blitzscaling you know, their neobank into the millions. But I wanted to end our conversation on a question about where our audience can learn more about Funbox and about you if they wanted to 
read more about the business or connect with you, where should they go? Funbox.com is a great place to get started in terms of learning about the company. And folks are always welcome to reach out to me on LinkedIn, uh, Prashant Faloria. And uh, I look forward to to hearing uh, from folks with, uh, with their thoughts and questions. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today and for sharing your journey. Thank you, Lex. Thanks for having me. Hi, everyone. That's it for this week's episode of the Fintech Blueprint. For more technical deep dives into all things fintech and decentralized finance, check out fintechblueprint.com and grab a free subscription to the newsletter. This is Lex, and I'll see you next time.